In this program, we will examine some simple models to explain the cooperative effect in terms of protein structure. Theories are important in this regard because they explain the magnitude of effects and because, as we shall see, they clarify the manner in which conformational changes are propagated through protein molecules. Two theories have emerged as relatively simple ideas which are close approximations of the truth. And we can follow the logic of these two ideas by these schematic diagrams shown on the board. Uh, here I'm using a circle to indicate the shape of an individual subunit in the protein. And here is a protein containing four subunits, which is actually the number of subunits in hemoglobin and the number of subunits in many enzymes involved in regulation. The principles don't depend on the number of subunits, uh, but it's most easily illustrated for one of about this complexity. Now, if we follow up what we've been saying just before in the ligand-induced changes, one says that the substrate binds to an individual peptide chain, causes a change in that peptide chain, which converts it from what we call the circle shape to the square shape. And that will then cause a modification of the neighboring subunits in some way, which I've indicated by a little line here, simply to remind you that this shape is closer probably to the initial protein that wasn't attached to any ligand, but is definitely changed from the unbound protein. And as the second substrate binds, it induces a shape change in the next subunit, and the third, and the third subunit, and the fourth finally saturates the protein completely. Now, how could this explain cooperativity? Well, as I said earlier, this ligand-induced change can change the thermodynamic relationships between the subunits. So let's assume that two neighboring squares bind each other much more tightly, much more sym in sympathetically than a square in a circle or two circles. Or let's say another way, let's say this distortion starts moving the shape of this subunit part way towards the ultimate shape that we call a square. Then what's going to happen is the first substrate is going to do some of the work for the second substrate. It's going to start changing the shape or changing the thermodynamic relationships. So what happens then is the second substrate is going to bind much more easily than the first. And the third subunit is going to bind its substrate more easily than the second, and so forth. So this is what, in other words, Bohr was saying with cooperativity, that is, we have a structural model which explains why the first substrate helps the second one to bind, the second help the third, and so forth. Now, if you think this over, this is a nice and satisfactory explanation, but we always ask in science, is the only explanation? And in fact, this model, which was proposed by us, actually came slightly after another model proposed by Minot, Wyman, and Schoenger, which approached the subject from a very different point of view. What Minot and his colleagues said was that the structure of the protein was bound by principles of symmetry, and that you could never change an individual subunit without altering the shape of other subunits in the same way. So that, in our symbolism, leads to this model, that the four subunits, and Minot postulated actually there was an equilibrium, so it actually went through a step of this sort, where one had a equilibrium between the protein all in the form of circles and a protein all in the form of squares. And now to make a very simple illustration, we will say that only the protein all in the form of squares binds substrate. Then you see what happens. The symmetry says these are the only two forms. The first molecule of substrate binds, the second, third, and fourth. 
But really, if you examine this, you see that the first molecule of substrate tends to pull the equilibrium from left to right. And so it really does most of the work for the remaining substrates that bind. So in a sense, the first substrate makes it easier for the next substrates to bind. And so there, again, is another explanation of cooperativity. And these two models, then, can explain the binding of oxygen to hemoglobin, of inhibitors to regulatory enzymes, of activators to regulatory enzymes, and of lots of different phenomena that we observe in nature. Now, how do you tell the difference between the two? We'll come to that in a moment, but I'd just like to emphasize one thing while I have these on the board. You will notice that this molecule is, goes through a number of states, but in the case of the symmetry model, there are only really two states of the protein, either all circles or all squares. That's what the symmetry condition leads to, and that's what we mean by concerted, that is, all of the subunits change essentially simultaneously. That doesn't mean they have to do it in time, it just means you don't see any intermediate species. On the other hand, the sequential model, or ligand induced, says the substrate induces a distortion, and we now have what we call hybrid conformational states. That is, states in which some of the subunits are in the form of the square, and some in the form of a circle, and some even intermediate states. And now by X-ray crystallography, or nuclear magnetic resonance, or a number of different ways, one can examine whether or not one or the other of these conditions applies. The test of any model is whether it fits experimental data. And in the case of hemoglobin, the sequential model fits the data very well. However, the symmetry model fits the data equally well. And thus, a choice between these models cannot be made from these data alone. However, there is a case where dramatically different results occur between the two models. And this was discovered somewhat by accident in our laboratory. We were applying some of the concepts that I've been discussing to the mathematical equations we derived. And we decided that the interactions between one subunit and the next could be expressed by some constants, which we called KBB. B stands for the subunit that is the square, and A for the subunit which is the circle. And KBB means that the interaction is occurring between two subunits in the square conformation. If you think over what I said earlier, there are three possibilities. There can be no interaction, that is, the bulge in one subunit doesn't affect the other subunit, which we call the KBB equals 1. The second possibility is that one subunit decreases the stability of the other subunit, which would give a value of KBB less than 1. And the third is that it stabilizes the subunits, which gives a value of KBB greater than 1. And so the logical thing is you just apply this to the mathematics and put it in the computer. And what we did this, and lo and behold, we got something very unusual. We got not only the two types of curves that I mentioned earlier, the hyperbola and the sigmoid curve, but we actually got a curve that was much flatter than either of these curves. If you call this kind of Michaelis-Menten interaction, no interaction between the subunits, as though each subunit is an island unto itself, and this kind of interaction, positive cooperativity, that is, one, sub, one molecule of substrate helps the next one to bind, what we were observing was something which we called negative cooperativity. Cooperativity in the sense that one subunit was altering the shape of neighboring subunits, but negative in the sense that it was making it more difficult for the next substrate to bind. Now, why 
would we be upset by this? The answer was very simple. At the time this mathematical result came out, there was no known example of negative cooperativity. Biologists all believe in survival of the fittest in teleology, and the argument is that if this kind of behavior occurred, why wouldn't somebody have found an enzyme that followed this behavior? But the more we thought about it, the more it seemed logical, because as I said earlier, there was no real reason to think that a distortion of a protein molecule of the ligand-induced type that we've discussed should necessarily make the molecule fit together better. You could easily see that it might, in certain cases, make it less favorably joined. In that case, negative cooperativity was very logical. And therefore, we started to look. And indeed, it turns out that a plot of negative cooperativity on a normal plot looks very much like a hyperbola. Unless you're looking very closely, the two look identical. And in fact, when we looked at it carefully, we found many examples of negative cooperativity. The finding of negative cooperativity was interesting theoretically because there was, in this case, a clear distinction between the models. As I've said before, the ligand-induced model could readily explain this kind of cooperativity by simply assuming that the interactions between neighboring subunits were unfavorable. In the symmetry or concerted model, it was quite clear that negative cooperativity was inconsistent with the model. This can be seen qualitatively in the following way. The model presupposes there is an equilibrium between two states of the protein, which was given the equilibrium constant L in the original postulation. This was called the T0 state of the protein, this the R0 state, and this equilibrium is shifted in the direction from left to right shown here towards the form which binds the substrate preferentially. Now you can see that qualitatively that all substrate can do is make it easier for subsequent molecules of substrate to bind. The most that could happen as far as cooperativity is concerned is if L had a value of zero, which interpreted in this model means that all of the protein was in the form of the R0 state to begin with. In that case, of course, there'd be no further change in conformation, and this would lead to a Michaelis-Menten binding. Or another way of looking at this is to look at it mathematically. The binding of the substrate to the enzyme is such that it follows an equation of this sort. In this equation of the symmetry model, Y bar represents the fraction saturation and L, the equilibrium constant of R0 to T0 we have discussed before. The lowest value that L can have is zero, since it is an equilibrium constant and cannot be a negative number. If L is zero, the expression simplifies to the form Y bar equal alpha S over one plus alpha S which is indeed the form of the Michaelis-Menten equation. Thus, the extreme of the minot wyman changeur model is a hyperbolic curve, and it cannot give negative cooperativity. This then provides a diagnostic test between it and the sequential model, which does give negative cooperativity. The question that now arises is, what is the advantage to a living system of cooperativity? And we can get a clue to this by looking at the plot of the cooperativity as we discussed it before. Here is the percent saturation, say a binding of oxygen to hemoglobin or a ligand to an enzyme or the activity of an enzyme as a function of the ligand concentration, in this case, the substrate concentration. And if we look at these, the case of no cooperativity 
which is a hyperbola, or Michaelis-Menten curve, is shown here. It approaches the full saturation value of 1.0 rather moderately slowly. Positive cooperativity gives a sigmoid curve and approaches it much more steeply. And we can see this if we now take the quantitative analysis of what happens if we go from 10% saturation, which is at this point, to 90% saturation, which is at this point. We can now compare how much change in ligand concentration is required to go from 10% saturation to 90% saturation of a particular protein. And let's start first with the case of no cooperativity, which is the classical Michaelis-Menten curve. At 10% saturation, the value is approximately here. And at 90% saturation, it's approximately at this point. So it takes a change of ligand concentration indicated by this line to go from 10% to 90% saturation. Actually, this factor is 81. In the case of positive cooperativity, however, you will see that this turns out to be quite a different number. The 10% intersection point is shown here, and the 90% intersection point is about here, and it requires a change in concentration of only this small amount to go from 10% to 90% for a highly cooperative protein of this sort. What does that mean? That means basically that this protein is very sensitive to small changes in the environment. A tiny change in the ligand concentration is immediately amplified into a very large signal. What happens in the case of negative cooperativity? In the case of negative cooperativity, the 10% saturation point is about here, and the 90% saturation point for this case, which is actually only moderately negatively cooperative, would be beyond the end of this board. I couldn't even write it. It is rising so slowly. It will eventually cross the same axes as the others, but at a much, much greater concentration of ligand. Now, what does that mean in terms of living systems? What it means is, but if you want to be moderately responsible, moderately responsive to changes in the environment, one has a no cooperative situation. If you want to detect very small changes, either because you want to detect the odor of a molecule, which is in very low concentration, or responses to changes of, say, ATP levels, which is kept rather controlled in a living system, then you have positive cooperativity because it immediately amplifies a small response. On the other hand, if you want to be relatively insensitive to rather wild fluctuations in the environment, then the enzyme has negative cooperativity because rather large changes cause only small changes in enzyme concentration. So the question of whether you want to amplify a signal or desensitize it or be somewhere in between seems to be the reason for this variation in cooperativity levels. In a sense, it is the fine-tuning of the regulatory enzyme. And all of these things that I have been saying apply not just to the substrate, but also to the inhibitor and the activators as well as the substrates. That is, the binding of any of these molecules to enzymes can be cooperative or positively or negatively or not in the same way that the binding of a substrate can be. To summarize what we have been doing in both programs, we can see that a flexible enzyme can be turned on and off by chemicals binding to allosteric sites. If the activator molecule binds to an allosteric site, it induces a conformational change such that the substrate binds more readily to the site. On the other hand, 
an inhibitor molecule can bind to another allosteric site, inducing a conformational change which turns off the enzyme because it makes the active site incapable of binding substrate molecules. These principles of regulation can be illustrated for the enzyme CTP synthetase, which shows a beautiful example of cooperative effects. The active site binds ATP, UDP, and glutamine, whereas the allosteric site binds GTP. When GTP binds to the enzyme, it induces a conformational change which propagates to the glutamine portion of the active site, converting it to a form which binds glutamine more readily. The same conformation and change is transmitted to the neighboring subunit, making it more difficult to bind the second molecule of GTP. This means the enzyme is negatively cooperative in respect to GTP. ATP shows positive cooperativity by inducing a conformational change which extends across the two subunits to make the second molecule of ATP bind more readily than the first. And interestingly enough, glutamine induces a conformational change which does not extend beyond the borders of its individual peptide chain, so it shows no cooperativity. So this same enzyme is programmed to show positive cooperativity towards ATP, negative cooperativity towards GTP, and no cooperativity towards glutamine. This means it is highly sensitized to small fluctuations in ATP, desensitized to rather large fluctuations in GTP, and moderately responsive to changes in glutamine levels. These qualitative concepts can be made quantitative by following the course of saturation as ligand concentration is changed. The hyperbola of no cooperativity rises slowly with increasing substrate concentration to approach the asymptotic value of one. The curve of positive cooperativity has a lag and then rises very rapidly over a very short range of substrate concentration to the saturation value. On the other hand, the curve of negative cooperativity rises slightly more rapidly than the hyperbola at first, but then flattens out and is basically desensitized over a wide range of substrate concentration. These curves would be exciting if they were simply mathematical ideas. When it is realized that they are actually the reflection of the delicate three-dimensional geometry of proteins, they are truly amazing. What has happened is that the protein has evolved to have regulatory sites which can either turn on or turn off the enzyme activity and a clever juxtaposition of subunits to fine tune these relationships. The net result is the protein is exquisitely sensitive to the environment. This beautiful machine, therefore, provides the sensitivity and the regulation to make the biological organism survive. This is the era of molecular biology, and it is interesting that we can explain so many of the features of living systems by the structure of protein molecules. And perhaps what is even more fascinating is that there are a lot of phenomena still remaining to be discovered to fill in the gaps of our knowledge. Hopefully, the study of proteins, their flexibility and their interactions will lead us to even more exciting and more stimulating answers.